Hello, beautiful human. Thanks for clicking on our conversation with Madison Beer. We have an entire album to dissect. It is called Life Support. There's a link in the description below. If you haven't heard it yet and while you're down there, please hit like. Leave your honest feedback in the comment section below. And even if you hate us, please subscribe. We beg. Um, also, today's conversation is being sponsored by Total Wireless. Do amazing with Total Wireless. Here we go, Daniel. Let's go. Let's go. Let's do this. Hello, beautiful human. I am Zach Sang. That is Dan Zola. Hello. And we welcome, via the power of the internet, Madison Beer. Woo! Woo! We have, a, we have an album to discuss, my friend. Good to see you. I know. Good to see you, too. I missed you. I missed you both. Do you mean that seriously when, when Daniel is in the conversation? I really look forward to our interviews. Like, genuinely, I'm excited when I see on my schedule Zach Sang. I'm like, yes. You know, I'm no David Dobrik, but I do, I, I do try. You have, you, it's, you can't compete where you can't compare, Zach. No, You're it, proper, you are a proper interviewer. I enjoy our interviews. Well, I thank you. And you give us a lot to discuss today with Life Support as the album. This is years in the making, right? Like four years at least? Three? Four years. I think it was like 21 years. Jesus, what? Yeah, yeah. Basically, it's, it's been my, since I came out of the womb, I've started um, <laughs> this album. But uh, no, we've been actually it for over a year now which is crazy oh. like it was it was supposed to come out march 27th of last year that was the date and it got i mean i remember on your show at last time i was on i was like yep my album's coming out in like a month that was like a year ago so um yeah it was supposed to come out and then we pushed it and we pushed it and then it got to the point that i was like why are we just pushing this because we don't know like what's going to happen in the world let's just get it out there and like move the f on you know what is it that halted everything to begin with and do you feel like did the song stay the same between like march of last year and today oh. no, it was initially 12 songs and that was big in itself like 12 songs on an album is like not that common anymore i feel like and so it's We're at 17 to sister it's grown to 17 now so we've added songs we've taken some away which i guess like it was a blessing in disguise having it be pushed back because i was able to like really really sit and like marinate on it mm. and just be like is there anything i should change or take out or whatever and turns out there was a bunch that needed changing and like even like i think immediately of emotional bruises that song we completely like gutted and redid it and added so many different elements to it and like we wouldn't have been able to do that or have done that if it wasn't for um the amount of time but what you asked was like the reason it was pushed was because it was supposed to come out march 27th and then like early march like literally right after my birthday was when the pandemic like really started hitting and being like this really like unforeseeable thing that we had no idea how long it was gonna last whatever so they were like we shouldn't drop an album right now because it felt a little bit like what are we gonna I, there was no touring there was no nothing it was just very confusing to drop an album at that time so i was like okay we can push it but then every time it got pushed i was like this is not going away yet unfortunately so we should just release it now what changes in you like w w is it the environment that changes like how do you have a song a year ago that becomes totally different that you thought was finished yeah. but then a year goes by and now it becomes a different song. Like, what happens? Like, does somebody go, let's fix this? Or, what, like, walk me through that. Yeah, I just sit with it. Like, for so, I listen to my music more than I listen to anything else. And so the more I sit with it and the more that I'm just constantly, like, listening and um, psychoanalyzing everything, I'm like, okay, I feel like we can add elements to it. And then if I get one idea, I need to do it. Even if it's been mixed and mastered, I'm like, we have to open this back up and we have to redo it. Um, so yeah, with that one particularly, like there was no talk box. There was no like weird slide guitar stuff. It was kind of just like a stripped down song. And I just felt like there were so many elements that could elevate it. So it was really just adding final details to it all, but it's just me. It's just me thinking too much and being like, I need it to be everything. But I mean, are you grateful for the time at the end of the day? Yeah, no, for sure. At the end of the day, I'm really glad that I got to be able to like properly sit with it before releasing it because you can only have one debut and like I want it to be perfect, especially at this point. I've made everyone wait so long that it's like it needs to come out and be 
you know, everything that I wanted it to be from the start. So I am, I am in hindsight glad that I, um, I mean, I'm not because I wish it has been out for so long, but I am because I'm glad that well, I got to live with it. Think about it. Like if it would have come out last year, what would you have done to support it? At least now we have something to look forward to as a people, as a music loving community, because 2022, you know, hopefully you tour by then. Hopefully. I know. Fingers crossed. Was there ever a time where you thought about just like scrapping it and starting over? Ooh. Yes. I, uh, when it got to the point that it was like still unclear when the date was going to be like, we were in, well, not really selfish February of last year. And we were supposed to release the album March. And then when it was pushed to like April and then whatever, and it just kept getting pushed and pushed. I was like, by summertime, it kind of was like, I'm, I moved on from this time in my life. Like this was a period piece for me. I was really like upset because I felt like it was a moment in time that was encapsulated. And then I was kind of like being in a weird way, like still attached and like brought down by certain things that I feel much more healed by today. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if like the chapter is still open because the music is not out. So now I'm really looking forward that it's out to be like, okay, I can close this chapter let it affect other people, hopefully provide them with something positive and like I can move on with my life and like start the next album, which we've already started and it's so great. But um, yeah, like life support was just really, it was really tough. Like that was such a period in my life that I made that this album and the music and the lyrics are all so about like one time in my life that I was, there was a point that I was like, I might scrap the whole thing, but I couldn't, I couldn't. In order for closure, you have to put it out there. Um, and obviously, like, you are sending messages. So you said that there's, like, business that has been unfinished. And at least this music puts a period on it. Sour Times, is that song a message to one person? No, Sour Times is a really interesting one, actually. Um, it's kind of this, like, overarching thematic song, which is a take my take in a lyrical way on like kind of like an evolved version of home with you um it's kind of that same like so I have this whole thing where I think that like being taken advantage of can mean a lot of things and that also in my opinion can mean if you're in a vulnerable state or you've just gone through a breakup or you're mentally going through something like that also like can be a form of being taken advantage of not only if you're like super intoxicated or like on drugs or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think that um, people sometimes see an opportunity and they're like, Oh, this person's at a vulnerable place in their life. I can like swoop in and hook up with them or like befriend them, whatever it might be. And I think that when I was going through creating the album, I noticed a lot of people, men in particular were kind of like, it felt like I was like being preyed on, like being preying on the week and like, I felt like people were like, oh, like I can come over and like comfort you. If you like just things like that. And like, it wasn't a genuine thing. It was clearly just like a sexually driven thing. And I was just like, man, it makes me sad. And then I've spoken to so many people who have been like, yeah, the amount of guys who like comfort you during a breakup and they're actually just trying to like hook up with you. Like that's, that's wrong in my opinion. Like you shouldn't be preying on someone who's like in a vulnerable position. And so I like wrote Sour Times basically about like, I'm not going to, hook up with you or sleep with you or leave with you just because I'm going through something. I'm still going to be able to like go home and be alone at the end of the day and be fine. And so that was kind mm -hmm. of my take on like different forms of being like taken advantage of. Cause I don't know. You're talking about like you're coming out of a breakup and guys see a sad person who may be looking for comfort yeah. and they choose to take advantage of it because they, you know, I mean, clearly are insecure and clearly yeah. need to prey off emotional moments, right? Yeah, that's why, like, I made that song. So I feel like we, we always, you know, our conversations, when you get, when you hear, like, someone was taken advantage of, it's always like, oh, someone was, like, too drunk or someone, mm. whatever it might be. And But um, this is emotional. Yeah, like, and I think that's also, like, just the topic of mental health that I always spiel about. It's like, there's so many other layers that you can, like, take advantage of a person and also, like... Yeah, like it's just I don't know. I think it's just wrong, and like I've seen it, and I've had it done to me. So I'm just like I wanted to write that about this, and like the second verse where I'm like, it's crazy that you'd be down to be a rebound. Like I love that lyric because I'm just like, 
bro, what are you doing? Like, this is not like, I don't know. There's so many layers to it, but that was what Sour Times is about. Did you ever accept these uh, people's invitations or did you know what they were doing in the moment? No, I had. And that's why it kind of like messed me up in, in the end, because I ended up feeling like, wait, I was just like swooped on in like a, someone pretended to care for me and want to be there for me. But instead, like it was really just them seeing an opportunity. And I was, you know, I was silly enough to let them like get in my head and take advantage of me. And that's like a really tough thing is to afterwards be like, hmm. Because if your real intention is to, like, care for someone and make them feel better, I don't think, like, hooking up with them is going to be your number one priority. But that's just how I feel. No, and it shouldn't be. I mean, to be honest, it should be the last thing on your mind if right. – because, uh, I mean, you know, people do say, like, the best way to get over somebody is by getting under somebody else. Uh, I don't know. haven't experienced any of that. I disagree. But, yeah, it's not at all. Seems very unhealthy. Um, but I guess it depends on the relationship or the door that you're closing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really sad that somebody would do that. Clearly not a genuine friend. Um, yeah. How do you let that person go? Do you tell them, like, I know what the f*** you're doing? Or do you just go silent on somebody? I mean, depends the situation. Like, I'm I'm very, I don't want to say, like, cutthroat. But, like, I have I have come to a place, especially, like, everything I've gone through mentally. I feel like I'm at a place where I'm just, like, I take my the way I feel, I'm very like hyper aware to how I feel in a situation. If I'm uncomfortable, if someone makes me uncomfortable, if I'm not being like heard or seen, and I feel like I'm being silenced in a room, whatever, there's so many like examples, but I feel like I'm so hyper aware of that now that I don't really care if I come across like per se, because I'm like, I respect myself and I love myself so much at this point that like, I, I just, like I would rather spare my feelings than yours. And if something is being said or done to me that I find to be like out of whack and, you know, like goes against my boundaries then I have no problem, like literally standing up in a room and being like, Hey, this isn't for me. Yeah, Y'all are not it. And I'll see you later. Madison out. <laughs> You're doing that for a reason. So who cares how somebody like interprets your actions, you know, because at the end of the day, it's your safety, which is paramount. Yeah, and I'm, like, super sensitive, and I'm someone who's very, like, I want to say unstable, but, like, someone who's very easily triggered. I'm very easily, like, upset by things. I take things really personally, and so if I'm – I'm not going to put myself in a position and, like, allow myself to get triggered or feel in any way, be, like, to spare somebody else's feelings. I just won't do it anymore. But it doesn't stop you from being out there and, like, essentially living and, like – you know, you, you don't stop. I mean, some people could feel that way and then become a hermit. Yeah. No, I've definitely, like, learned how to cope and learned how to, like, align myself. And, you know, if I'm, like, in an environment where, like, there's been plenty of times where I'll be, like, really f triggered. Sorry, I know I can't curse. I'll You're be okay. Really, I'll be really triggered and I'll be really, like, freaking out and honestly having a panic attack. And I've just learned little things I can do that might make me feel better. If I'm out in public, I literally will, like, walk away and be like, hey, I have to take a phone call. And I'll just pretend to be on the phone or like mm. sit down by myself and breathe and center myself. There's just been little things I've been able to over the past few years, learn how to integrate into my everyday life. Cause I used to literally just go home. It would just be like, that was the end of my night. If I was upset about something, I would just dip and do a little like, you know, Casper leave where I just didn't say goodbye to anybody. In and Irish exit. I love it. So I just was, I would just do that. And then, um, go home and like sit and be upset and not have anyone to talk to. But now it's like, I've learned how to leave and like center myself. And if, if, if I have to go, I will, but most of the time I'm able to kind of like gather myself a bit and then go back and like, even pull someone aside and be like, Hey, please don't say X, Y, and Z around me. It doesn't make me feel good, whatever. And I just think like, there's so much stigma around doing that. Cause people are like, well, I'd feel so awkward going up to someone being like, Hey, don't do this or say this around me. It makes uncomfortable because that's obviously an uncomfortable thing to talk that's to say totally like you have to come to a place where like you you put yourself and your boundaries before anybody else's comfortability and like even if you come across like that person and like it's awkward who cares just just if it'll give you peace of mind to me i say go for it when's the last time you had to do that um i did it like kind of recently and it was like i don't know i do i do it all the time i i, I kind of like I don't know. I don't even know how to like go about like saying it, but um, I, 
I feel like men in particular, actually, I've heard a lot of girls do it too, which like breaks my heart, but I've heard a lot of men like to make jokes about sexual assault, uh, particularly the R word. And I get really like, what? Yeah. Like what does that? No, no. Whoever, whoever you're associating that does that should like, I fully agree, but they need to get help. Younger boys, like there's like a Fortnite term when you like jam your mic up really loud and it's like literally called like something to do with that. I like can't even say it a lot, but people just say it like, I don't know, I've heard guys before in the past be like, oh, like, you know, that, that, uh, that bar like R worded us instead of saying like, oh, like they screwed us over. You know what I mean? Like I've heard that be said before. And I'll just be like, yo, like, don't say that word around me and don't say that in a joking manner. It's not funny. You have no idea who's around you. You have no idea who's been through anything. And I just like, don't, I don't tolerate it. And honestly, I've created a friend group and like people around me who know that. And I don't really like, I just don't care at this point. I'm just like, it's okay. I don't care if people think that I'm like sensitive. I I am. And like, it's also, that's not something to be sensitive over. That's very completely valid to not want you to make like a sexual assault joke or use a really horrible word that can like extremely trigger certain people in a joking way. And so I just, yeah, everyone around me who's close with me knows to never, ever say that in any context at all. And if it is, it's like, they like completely protect me and they're like, yo, are you good? And like, are you okay? You're talking about all these emotions you, ex- you experience, but in Stay Numb and Carry On, do you say I've become emotionless? I do. Yeah, I, I do say that. Can you explain why that situation caused those yeah. feelings? Stay Numb and Carry On was written really closely after I was diagnosed with BPD and I wanted to write a song about how it kind of feels a lot of the time. And having it I feel like there's this constant like either hyper god complex like I'm you know undefeatable and I'm invincible and I'm amazing and da 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 da. and then there's this like complete polar opposite which could be within an hour of each other that's just like if someone hurts me sometimes it'll either be like I'm I'm so upset I can't even begin to explain to you how like upset and heart-wrenched it makes me or it'll be like I am shutting all emotions off. I'm turning my heart and brain off because I've been hurt so many times that I'm like, I can't endure any more of it. And I just will like literally pretend and like try my best to be a zombie. Um, So those lyrics were literally just like that side of it, which is just like, I've become emotionless. Like if like you can try to hurt me, you can't. I've already like, I'm shielded and there's just no point in even attempting and like, yeah. And I was thinking about this this morning. So weird. In in relation to Chris Brown, you know, I make like I don't really like playing playing Chris Brown's music. That's just the truth. And um, I was go I was in the shower for some reason thinking about this, and it was the, the, the thought was essentially what we're talking about now. Like the public enables artists, right? Like like the only way art survives is if people choose to consume it. And by our consumption, artists then are enabled and privileged. They have wealth and means and, you know, in in, in a lot of cases, a great deal of power and responsibility. That being said, do we as a consumer have an obligation then to be aware of whose art we're consuming? Because that consumption, I mean, it can grow so much. I'm like I talked about cancel culture re- recently and that was like a big part of it when I was just like like there's certain things that I think when we cancel people it's like what are we really doing and like is this a better opportunity we have to educate somebody and like hope that they've grown since said event or are there things that are genuinely unforgivable that should make us rethink who we're giving platforms to and who we're giving like so much power and wealth and like fame and everything in the world too. And there's like, to me, there's just a difference. And I think that like cancel culture particularly sometimes goes after people that I'm like, I think we could have just educated somebody and maybe also given them some benefit of the doubt, let them tell their side rather than just being like, Nope, you're done. And like get sent a million death threats. And, but then there's also the other side of it where someone will do something that is completely unforgivable. That's genuinely just like, you're a bad person. And then that makes us be like, okay, but we made you famous. We put you on. Yeah. And by the way, like I'm waiting for like a genuine like note or something from Chris Brown of any genuine nature 
because yeah. like, you know, just seek help, at least let the public know, because the truth is like, we put you on, but we can put you out too. Right. And I think that's amazing. Like, I think that's an amazing thing in our day and age that we actually are able to mobilize communities. Like everyone is able to like write someone off or write someone on. I think that's awesome. And it's Culture's great. democratized. If you think about it, right. Music to yeah. a certain degree is more democratized today than it ever was before. I think it's I think it's cool like I think it's genuine like obviously we, you've seen everything that's gone on with like GameStop and AMC and whatnot it's like that's like to just moon. mobilizing a community of people and it can completely change the world virtually and it's very powerful and it's a very interesting conversation but that's like writing stay and carry on I just wanted to send that message of like it was the same kind of theme of you don't really know who you're putting on you don't really know who you're subscribing to like you see what you what we want you to see we're only showing you a fraction of what reality is and i think that that's just something that should be noted and like you should go into it being like okay maybe i don't maybe i shouldn't literally think that this person because sometimes i'll see someone get like canceled or whatever and people be like not my idol no like they would never do this i'm like you don't know these people like you do not know anybody and so it's just like once you you don't feed into the matrix of the whole thing anymore and you start like undoing the facade of it and you're like, okay, this might not be as legit. Then the kind of like that love of like, you know, you think, you know, somebody so much kind of goes away, which I think is a healthier and better alternative. Like I say that like the, my platform sometimes feels more, more like a chopping block a lot of the times and it can be really tough. I think, there's more famous people today than there's ever been in history. And I think famous is like in quotes, you know what I mean? Like, like, man, there's so many people who are like, I meet little kids and I'm like, what do you want to be when they grow up? And they're like famous. And I'm like, Oh, yeah. no, we don't, you don't want to be famous. Like, please. No, like just no, 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 no. It breaks my heart because it's just such this glamorized glorified thing. That's pretty much nonsense. And it's so, Ugh, like fame is the downside and fame is the repercussion for creating art and for wanting to pursue your dreams. And like, it's not, it's not the perk. What, like, where did this idea come from? It's just so smoke and mirrors. And so like famous equals glamour equals money equals happiness. Like, no, <laughs> like absolutely not. It's just not the case. There's so many downsides to it. Of course, there are obviously also upsides. Like there's, it's a double edged sword, but man, like, Hearing yeah, but some... you don't realize all the negative sides of it until you've experienced it. Like a lot of these people just see the glitz and the glam in Hollywood and money. Saying is like you like listen to me. I will shout it from the top of the rooftops. Like I have literally been at the lowest point that a human being could be. I have literally wanted to and attempted to take my own life. I wanted to not be here anymore. And I have millions of followers and I have all the streams. I got whatever. It doesn't solve your problems. Like it does not make things go away and if you struggle in any type of way like it's only going to amplify it and it's only going to put a magnifying glass over everything and people are going to have their opinions in there and it's just like it's not what it shapes up to be and yeah then why continue if because if I love music and i love like there's so many upsides as well like my best friend in the whole world i met on instagram i've never met her in person we're internet friends like Things like that make it so worth it. My fans, the connection I have with them, like over the past week of release, like they've made their icons all things and they've changed their names and they have gotten pre-order life support trending multiple times. Like they, they have impacted my life in the most positive way I could ever begin to tell you. And I feel like there's upsides for sure. And I wouldn't be able to create my music or my art without also being present on social media or whatever. And like, putting my personality and myself out there, which is fine. I'm like, at this point, you know, it's okay, but it's not all negative, but there's just like want for the sole reason to want to be famous. I think that's like a little bit scary. Wanting to take your own life and that acknowledgement and then having to, I'm assuming like seeking help after that, right? Like yeah. you, you speak up about those thoughts. You talk to somebody yeah, no, I, I uh, was basically 5150 and I had like a really, this was like Mitt's making the album, which is why I titled it Life Support. But I had like a really um, scary and tough time. And um, I was, yeah, I was in therapy three times a week. I still see my therapist very often, but I was in therapy three times a week, voicing all my stuff. I had my whole house basically like raided and all sharp objects and stuff were 
removed. And it was, it was, it was a lot. It was really crazy. I was um, self-harming every day. I was just like, I was, I don't even want to say I was lost. I just like was, I had given up and I was like, I don't really like care to be here. Cause I just, I don't know. I, I really internalize things. And I, um, when I'm hurt, it just feels like the world is over. And I put so much of my faith and my trust and my heart in people, which is my own like personal flaw. Um, but I, I put so much of my energy and my love and time into other people. So when I get hurt, it hurts so much more. And yeah, I don't know. I just, I felt, I was at a time where I felt like I was being dealt all bad cards in my personal life. And I felt like everything was kind of crumbling around me and with someone with BPD or like someone who really struggles with anxiety and depression and whatever, like myself, like I, that could push me over the edge within a day. I can go from waking up that morning with a smile on my face to wanting to end my life by the end of the day. And it's a lot. Well, you said personal life. I was going to ask, was that mostly personal life or did the internet have an effect on that too? Over this past summer. So with this, this, this all I'm referring to was two summers ago now, I believe. And yeah, July of 2019, I guess. Um, but this summer, uh, yeah, that was a lot. I had, I felt like the whole internet hated me again, which was really triggering and um, scary for me because I had been, I've been doing this since I was 12 and I have been, I've had my waves of like, you know, everyone hates me and then people like me. And then like the pendulum kind of always has like swung with me. I feel like with my internet presence and it was a lot. It was really scary. So basically I joined TikTok and I immediately was welcomed with such an abundance of love and support. And everyone was like, oh my God, we love you, whatever. And I was so excited and I was so happy. And I was like, oh my God, people like me. And then it changed and it was just immediate, like, we hate you. And every single video on my For You page, I couldn't even open TikTok because it was just making fun of me. Every single video was another person ripping me to shreds. And it was so hard and so bad. But I will say it made me start to really work on my self-love because I realized something, which I think is very important for a lot of people to note. Like, if you're getting that upset and that destroyed and that hurt by random strangers just talking a bunch of about you, then like you might not have the best relationship with yourself because then you, you, you know, you might like, why are you so affected by what these random people are saying? So I kind of started to be like, okay, you know what? I don't really care if you all think I'm an evil monster and you want to paint me as everything that I'm not and you want to not see me for who I am or see the goodness in my heart or whatever it might be. That is fine because at the end of the day, I can look at myself and I could be like, you're good and you're a good person and you have good intentions and you have a beautiful heart and don't ever change that because there's been times, man, where I'm like, I don't want to be a good person anymore. The world's done me so wrong. I felt I felt like that I'm like, I don't want to, like, why am I still a good person? Like, I should just be this vindictive, evil monster at this point. If that's what everyone wants to make me out to be, I should just play the part. And I was just like, you know, I was going through that. And then that's when I kind of was like, yeah, I'm not going to let others' opinions of me define myself. Like, I know, I know who I am and I know my heart and I know my intentions. I know what I would and wouldn't do or say or partake in, et cetera. And so I just like built up my relationship myself and then i i don't really get as affected anymore so you build up a relationship with yourself to shield or to at least create a thicker skin as it relates to internet and stranger hate and damage but the personal side is what fueled everything two summers ago correct or was it yeah that's like what initially fueled it all and like made it really hard and you know there's been like i've opened up i feel like about a lot of stuff i've gone through i've been um i've been pretty open about a lot of things but there's like a handful of traumatic things that have happened to me that I don't know if I'll ever be ready to open up and talk about publicly because um I don't believe that I should until I'm like genuinely healed from these things but the stuff I have talked about like it's so many people have come up to me and been like you've helped me so much and you've made me feel like less alone and um just like that stuff makes it very worth it and well, that is what I'm wondering. Like, are these scars still existing? Like, is this like, have you moved on? Like, is that captured in this album at all? And does that mean that you've healed and moved on or? No, 
oh, I think I'm, I'm still healing. I think healing is a never ending process, but I, um, I'm at a better place with everything for sure. I feel a lot better and I feel much more able to talk about these things because when you talk about things publicly, like you're going to most likely be ripped apart and chewed up about anything and like, you know, opening up to especially a place that is always constantly never ending changing with their opinions on me. I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to open up about this and people are going to use it as something to make fun of me with. And I'm not ready for all that, you know? So, um, yeah, it's been tough. It's been weird, but I'm, I'm still like working through it. Are you in a, a nostalgic place? Are you like, re like, how do you get there? I just talk a lot. And like when I'm in the studio, I just rant about like experiences and my writers and producer and everything. They know everything about me literally. And I just am like, we can write about this, but it has to be discreet. And it can't be too like, you know, like stand up and carry on that whole song is a, is like, kind of if you listen to it all the way through you're like i don't really get what i just listened to but also okay. like i do is there anything that comes effortless to you now yes thankfully like what that whole song i was saying how i like you know had to force a smile i had to force a happy day um i i i have those now and i can actually like be happy and feel good about things and not you know like wallow in my misery all the time so even just like, I'm just grateful that I can laugh and smile and enjoy my time without being always constantly like interrupted by negative and scary thoughts. What changes? The people you surround yourself with? No, I try not to give myself too, I try not to give other people too much credit in like okay. my healing. That's also something that I say to my fans all the time because some fans will be like, you saved my life or, you know, you got me out of like, and I'm like, you no, you did that. Like, don't give me the credit because I maybe helped you, but you did that. You got yourself out of that dark place. And that's completely not for you to take away from yourself. Like recognize that within yourself and tell yourself, like, I'm proud of you. Don't tell me, you know, cause you got, you did this, you did this yourself. And so I think it's this kind of like matter of yes, 100%. There were people around me, my therapist, my friends, whatever who got me out of that time and I probably wouldn't have been able to do it without them particularly making the album and my people I made it with but on the same token I got myself out of there and I wouldn't have been able to do it without you know my strong will and my thick skin and I feel like that's important to know and I try not to like discredit that too much is there anything creatively that comes effortless to you yeah now it does it like, like again it's all just been growth like we write song we wrote literally my we have seven songs on the second album already and we had four days of a writing camp like we write songs so quickly and so like they just flow now and it's just so rewarding and so fun to like be able to create music i'm also drinking apple juice so don't judge me thank you well, uh, it's okay uh, i love apple juice yeah I i'm a martinelli's guy me too me too especially the ones that you can bite and they sound like an apple oh yeah <laughs> that's so cool does uh, all this come easy to you because you finally found like what kind of music you want to make and you're not being forced to do something you don't want to do yeah for sure like i i feel like if i was still trying to be like crammed into this box i would not be able to i just wouldn't put an album i would be like no i'm not doing that i could release singles forever but um an album like it has to be me and i really i wasn't gonna put it out unless the label was down for me to like make it like i wanted it to be because it's a weird album like it's not necessarily a pop album you listen to it and you're not like oh this is pop straight up you know it's very like multifaceted multi-category genre album i think so well, yeah you definitely hear all the influences you've talked about in the past whether it be like lana del rey or tame impala or i know you're into like 1950s or 60s you can hear some of that in there we know you're very uh heavily influenced by movies the whole thing is kind of cinematic was that the goal to put all those influences into madison yeah, I think I think 100% I wanted to kind of pay homage to the things that I loved and the artists who I really respect and who've impacted me so much. But um, yeah, I I just wanted it to be me. I wanted you to be able to listen to it blindly. And if you've heard like me ever speak, you're like, okay, this is probably Madison Beer singing and it makes sense. And it's like, it finally feels like it aligns with who I truly am, which means so much because sometimes I put out a song and I'm like, yeah, this is cool, but like, it doesn't represent me. But that's a lot of pressure to put on one song. But like, that's how I feel about social media is I'm like, 
you look at my Instagram, it's like, that's not me. Like, you don't know me. I can't, I can't post my whole personality all the time. Like, there's no way to do that. So I kind of, I'm like the kind of person where I'm constantly feeling like I have to like show the world, like, this is actually who I am. Pay attention to who I truly am. And this is the album. I think it does that finally and actually like explains to people who I am. Well, do you understand anything more about your sound and the sound you want to create moving forward after making this album? For sure. Yeah. I, I think it's just like whatever feels right and good to me. I don't, I can't put like a name on it or a description, but I, I feel like I'm just doing things that feel good to me. Like the second album that we're making right now is like very different from life support, but it's also like still just me. And like, so what have you pulled from life support that you're taking with you? Life support gave me the ability to actually like have confidence in writing songs and actually have confidence, like having input on the production side. So I think what I mainly would be taking is like the fact that I have the strength and the ability to actually like write music confidently now, because life support is what made me um, able to do so prior to life support. I feel like I was always a little bit nervous in a room and I was like, like selfish was the first song I ever wrote that I was like, okay, this is really good. (laughs) That was the first song that I was like, I can, I can write music. And I, I came up with all the strings and all the harmonies and I was like, I want to, you know, like produce some of this as well. And so, yeah, it gave me a lot of confidence. Were you really alone on New Year's Eve? In the song that I'm, the, the New Year's Eve I was talking about, I was. Huh. I spent New Year's alone this year and it was the best New Year's ever. You love being alone. Love it. Why, why were you on, uh, why were you alone on New Year's that year? Because my ex-boyfriend like ditched me to go hang out with celebrities and stuff. When when he had a celebrity right in his own house? Yeah, man. Well, this was like, y'all setting me up. This was like two years ago. And this was like, we were at Delilah. Y'all know Delilah. Oh, and we know. yeah, we, we were at Delilah. And like, I don't know. I just, it was just a classic, like big New Year's party. And the whole night I was just by myself. And I was really sad because I was like, and then I think I think the night ended with us getting into like a fight or something and I ended up going home alone and I was really sad and I was like what the hell all right well I have a question since uh you've obviously had some very public relationships uh we're not going to name any names but <laughs> I've grown up I'm an adult now um you. yeah well is it hard for you to release these songs knowing people will kind of like go back see when they were written see who you're talking about taking people back five six seven times and they're like okay I know who this is about you know what I'm saying because yeah, uh, that's what I, I did. I mean, it's hard not to. Right. Yeah. Good for you. Um, I think that <laughs> he has a lot of time. That, yeah, I, th- I think that it's uh, it's kind of just what you get when you date an artist. To be completely frank, like I'm gonna write songs about you, bro. It's okay. It's gonna happen. Um, but I don't really mind it. No, I think like when I choose now, I'm much more mindful about what I put out there because I'm like, once it's out there, it's out there for good, you know. So I feel like I I decided to make my relationships public with certain people that I, I don't know, who cares? I don't really care. It's okay. I mean, in Selfish, I like literally say his sign and stuff. So it's a little like blatant. And I'm not trying to hide it either. I want the songs to come across as like real and organic as possible. Interesting. Um, does it make it hard to love moving forward? Yeah, relationships scare me. I'm a very like, I'm just protective with my heart. And I'm like, I, 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 in my eyes, it's so negative, but everyone is guilty until proven innocent. So like when I date someone or start seeing somebody, I'm like, you're going to hurt me so bad. And I'm going to be so like destroyed because I really like you. And like, I don't know. I just am like much more careful when I get myself involved with somebody and I'm I pay attention to red flags a lot more than I did in the past. And I'm very, very like, this is what I will tolerate. This is what I won't. And if you step out of bounds, yeah. hit the road, you know? So are, are you dating David? No, no. Didn't we make that clear in the podcast? I don't know, dude. I, you know, to be honest with you, I, you know, you know, somebody else watched it for me. <laughs> I was hoping you'd be wearing your gummy bear necklace so I could ask a question about that, but you're not. But here I am asking about a necklace you're not even wearing. Gummy bear necklace? It's a teddy bear. It's not a gummy bear. Okay, same thing. Well, no, no, that's not true. You eat one and you hug another. You can eat both if you want. So you say relationship scares you, and it's not a bad thing, but it seems like you are often in a relationship. I am. I'm a codependent person. I'm still working through that, Dan. You're a what? 
I'm a very codependent person. I like, I, I, I also like enjoy, um, I'm not, you know what, to be fair, to defend myself, I'm not often in a relationship. First of all, I've been with the same two men back and forth for like the past six years, just them two. And then there's been other people since then. And I just, I've just chosen to not talk about it publicly because I feel like it's been going great offline. And I would like to keep it that way because it's, you know, it just complicates it all, all the time. And I feel like um, me and said individual are very um, happy offline. Wait, so um, there is a relationship going on? I will confirm. Yes. Zach, you, have you, I mean, if you go on the internet, it's, it's, it's sitting Be there. Quiet, Dan. What? I mean, I'm trying to just listen to the art, you know? I'm trying to let the art lead the way. I love this. I love that Zach, this is literally Zach's show, and you are the one who, like, makes Dan the bad guy always. It's the best <laughs> thing ever. I love it. But, no, I, I just, I, I really, like, it's tough because it's, like, there's also the sense of, like, am I, not disrespecting, but, like, is it, it makes, it could make somebody feel like, well, why were you public with your other boyfriends and not me or whatever, that kind of thing. But it's like, yeah, but then they're not dating you for the right reasons. Like, well, f- get married and then be public. Like, let's, yeah, let's no. cross a few bridges. Yeah, I agree. But it's also can be tough because it's like when you see that I was public in the past, but I'm like, I'm trying to protect us and protect this and cherish it offline because it's just like, it, it just complicates things. And I don't need people up in my relationship or my business. And I just, um, I've done it in the past and look how it's turned out both times. So it's like, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to do it again. And I feel like if I get to a place that I want to, sure. But like, I don't, I don't think I'm there. No, I, clout shouldn't be involved in, in these relationships. And uh, no, it, definitely, and that's, that's exactly why I don't want to do it. It's cause that's not, there's so many people who date nowadays to just like start conversations and to like, you know, yes, me, I'm, I'm out there all the time. Just dating up a storm. Dating up all the celebs in the, in the town. Dude, it's, they run away from me. It's crazy. It's, but it's just like that shouldn't play. If I agree, that shouldn't play a factor. Followers and who's like I don't know. I've seen people talk a lot of crap about me and certain people that I might be seen with. And like, well, why is she dating this person? I'm like, well, why do you care? You're not dating him. Leave me alone. Like, <laughs> what if I like him? Like, it's just it's just I don't know. And then it makes them feel bad. And I just I wouldn't want to. I, I don't know. Sometimes I feel guilty when I'm in a relationship because I'm like. The amount of stuff you have to go through because you're dating me, I feel I feel bad. I feel bad. But you should only unveil that side of it when you know it's somebody like who's capable of carrying that luggage. You yeah. know, like what you can't do that every time, and it's like you know, oh. oh and I also don't want to be that person who's always like, "This is my boyfriend and the love of my life," and then a month later, "This is my new boyfriend and the love of my life," and I'm like, "Babe, come on, let's not do all that." So. I try to keep it online until it's like, you know, know. real. Who, who is the person that. Hey, I said I'm an adult now. We're not naming names. Oh, we're not. We're okay. Got it. So it's not David Dobrik. It's not David Dobrik. David is my homie who never rejected me, making it crystal mud clear. Why did he do that? What, 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 I don't understand that. Is he dating somebody else? Is he like. <laughs> did he never rejected me this is just this dumb tiktok thing that people love to comment saying like this is the girl david rejected i'm like where did y'all get that it's because he said in a in a um we we did a video together one time on his channel we were like roasted each other Mm -hmm. and he was like you only like guys who have no interest in you that's why you've been in love with me for six months or whatever he said but it was a joke like we were joking and like Everyone has a crush on David at one point or another when they like start hanging out with him. Yeah, but I can say the same about you. Everybody has a, a crush on you at one point or, or, or another. Like I, a lot of stranger men that you never know have crushes on you at one point or another. That for sure. Every <laughs> <laughs> my DMs, they're frightening. I'm pretty sure I have a friend or two that's tried to get in there. My old assistant, she used to, like, one of her guy friends would DM her every single time she posted a story about me, like, the most vulgar oh, stuff. No. And I would be like, you're crazy. Like, literally, he would say the craziest stuff. And what a like, disgusting pig. And, and, you know, the internet really gives somebody a shield. They really do think that is like, you, you could say whatever and it's not going to get back to them. I finally met. I was like, hi, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Madison. He's like, nice to meet you. I'm like, I've literally seen you say that you want to eat for seven hours. So, <laughs> bro. Like, Whoa. <laughs> Uh, Hello there. Jesus Christ. Sorry, this is a PG show. I don't remember. No, it's okay. You're fine. 
Dan looking at his computer. It always scares me when Dan looks at his computer. No, I know what I can bring up and what I can't because yes. I'm, I'm smart now. Um, Homesick, you teased that on our show like a year or two ago, right? Yes. I did? Yeah, we listened to that song in the studio. You played it here for us. Oh my god, yes, we did. <gasps> Isn't that so crazy? That was so long ago. It, it really was. I mean, that two years ago, right? Uh, something like that, yeah. Y- yeah, you were here doing ASMR at the time, which... Oh my god, I loved that. We should do it again. By the way, like, I, I just, the comments on that video make me laugh. But um, I remember that. That was two years ago. Holy- well, is there a deeper message in that song, or is that you truly feeling be. like you don't belong here on planet Earth? Yeah, like, what's wrong with Earth? Okay, like, it's not that. Like, it's a, it's obviously metaphorical, and it's kind of just like, yeah, it's feeling like I've never really belonged here, and not in the sense of, like, I think I'm an alien. Like, people already have started with that, where they're like, oh, does she think she's an alien? I'm like, are y'all okay? Uh, you, you talk about, like, being abducted. It sounds like you're singing to, like, yeah. the alien lord yeah. above you. I'm singing to aliens. That's what I'm singing to. I'm not kidding. Like the song is literally like, it's like, um, and I'm so, there's the lyric where it's like, um, and you get to like, look down upon everybody and whatever, whatever. Like those are, and I'm alone faking at this after party, like that lyric and stuff. Like, yeah, that's me literally talking to like other life forms, um, that might be out there who I'm like jealous of. Cause I, I sometimes don't feel like, and that's another th- thing with like just BPD. Like I, I get, I dissociate a lot and I'll feel like this crazy sense of, I just, again, I'm just, I'm a bit dramatic, I guess. I, I like, if I get hurt by a lot of people, like consecutively, maybe I start to, um, I start to be like, I'm not bred the same way that some people are. And like, maybe that's just my poor choice in who I picked friends and colors being shown, which sucked, but, um, um, for the best. Yes. Yeah. But it, it's hard. And I feel like when things like that happen and you think, you know, somebody so well, and you think that you, you know, you really like, this is your person or these are your people. This is, this is your friend group. And then you'll hear about something or someone will do something. And you're just like, what man? Like, how I, and then that that'll lead me to the conclusion of like i don't belong on this planet y'all are like different we have baby still on the album stained glass there's 17 songs on this body of work it is called life support there's a link in the description below if you want to listen to it um what is stained glass about stained glass was one of the earliest songs written on the whole album um that song is pretty much just about like, I love the lyrics of St. Glass. I think arguably the most on the whole album. Like my skin is made of glass, but apparently it's stained. Cause you notice all my cracks, but can't look inside the pain. That's just my way of saying like, I've always been someone who I feel like my laundry has always been aired out for everyone to see. And I feel like I've never really been able to like experience things privately, I guess. And so it's like my skin's made of glass and then I say, but apparently it's stained because sometimes people don't ever factor in, well, like what don't we see behind closed doors and like what has she maybe been through that we don't know about and X, Y, and Z and all that kind of stuff. And so that's my, that's what that lyric is about. Just like, apparently it's stained, like apparently y'all can see the glass, but you just can't see anything that's deeper like than skin deep it's just it's just all superficial and nonsensical and so it kind of just was like oof and yeah I uh I wrote the second half of it which was the part like but you notice all my cracks we can't look inside the pain is like you notice you know like let's say a scandal or something I say that might be taken wrong or that I say that's wrong or whatever or mistake I've made but then you can't look at my growth or you can't look at you know, not seeing the full picture and the full person. Yeah. And that, that, that was kind of what I wrote that about was like, um, I was really exhausted and I'm really bummed about feeling like I was constantly being like painted as a monster, but then I was never given like any form of benefit of the doubt or like, you know, well, what is the real story behind this, et cetera, et cetera. Why is beginning vital to this album? Why did it need to be in there? We made that like right after we made Good and Goodbye. It's the same exact like notes as Good and Goodbye, which is why it transitions into it. But I don't know. I just wanted this big like thematic cinematic intro that felt just like vocals and something to just like set the tone kind of. Um, I didn't want to jump in to the album without an intro. I wanted there to be this kind of like setting your brain like into a certain gear 
to process the album, I guess. Channel surfing, you have an ending, you have a beginning and an ending, which I think is cool. Is that just like a recap of the whole process or is there like little hidden things in there that people may be able to catch? Yeah, no, that's that's literally just like all little snippets of pretty much each song. And then we have like our little Dear Society moment in it, which was so crucial to me to have in there because all the fans when it first the track was first came out they're like no dear society and I just was like no but like you're gonna see like a little something and I felt like it was a bit more impactful to have that was so what you hear at the end of channel surfing was genuinely the first time I had ever sang into the microphone singing the chorus of dear society and afterwards like you could hear me like mess up I'm like you're bad for my health I start laughing and I could, I literally couldn't even sing it because I was like tearing up and I was so excited. And that's what I say. I'm like, I can't even sing it. I'm so excited. And, and then you hear my writer, Kinetics, he's like, what have we done? And like, it's just this whole, like, it literally, the microphone captured this moment that was the start of something amazing. And I wanted it to be the last thing you heard before the album ended. What was the last song you made for the album? I guess technically Boy was the last song, but... Um, other than Boy, let me... I mean, Boy sounds different than the rest of the album. Yeah, Boy is different, because Boy was made, like, long after the album was, um, done. I feel like the last song we finished was probably, mm, 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 maybe Sour Times, I think was, like, the final song. For, for Boy, it is like a rock song. I mean, you got Pete Nappy on there, who is a rock guy. I really like him. Uh... You have a cool team on that record. How does that come to be? There's a lot of really awesome people who have worked on this album. Yeah, I mean, I just like, I don't know, like, it's, even just the people who wrote um, my album, like my two main writers, Kinetics and One Love, they wrote um, a lot of Melanie Martinez's Cry Baby. They wrote on K through 12. They are currently working with her again. Like, I love Melanie Martinez and I kind of like seek them out. I was like, okay, I need to work with these people. And find them and hunt them down and take them and use them. They're just amazing. And I was like, I need them on my team. And they've been on my team since I was like 15, 16 now, which is amazing. And we've like, it's so cool that they made, they wrote half my EP with me as well. So um, they've been with me since as she pleases, which is amazing. And so they, they're like from Melanie Martinez's camp. Leroy big taste is my producer. He, I made home with you with him. And that's kind of how he came into the mix. Um, Lowell is amazing. She worked on a lot of Bulo stuff, which I love her. So yeah, just, there's just been like, uh, I don't know. I kind of like listen to music in the credits and I'm like, okay, who can I work with? Who I feel like would kill what I'm going for. Are you going for two albums in one year? Yes. I kind of felt like that. Yeah, that's my goal. I hope, I hope to get it out by the end of 2021, the second album. Is it wrong to say that like, yes, you're inspired by a bunch of stuff that's come before, but there is some Ariana Grande energy that is woven through these records. I mean, Maybe. is that right to say? Uh, I mean, you know, Ariana has been one of my favorite people ever for like so much of my career and my just even like prior to my career. So I'm sure she's definitely influenced me a lot, just as all of these other people have like she's but I hate this narrative that's being, you know, has been pushed about me and her, you know, that it's kind of like this like competition thing where I'm like, this is like someone I idolize and somebody who I look up to. And I don't know why that that's like, why is it different that I say Lana inspired me versus Ariana? I just don't really get it. And I, I don't know, but I've always been very open and transparent that she's a huge inspiration to me. And she's someone who I've looked up to for so long and I admire her strength and her talent immensely. We have to talk about Follow the White Rabbit because I know you've been teasing that one for a very long time and people are very excited for it. People love Follow the White Rabbit. I did that on a live stream, like, probably over a year ago. Um, and it was just like that. I, I honestly shouldn't have done it that soon. Cause now all I've been hearing for the last year is bald white rabbit. Um, but <laughs> they love, they love, they love it. Um, the fans are really excited for it. And I love that they immediately understood the matrix, Alice in Wonderland reference, et cetera. And yeah. Like is there a parallel in that to your existence? For sure. Yeah. I think that like, I kind of have this like, I mean, I'm a big Matrix lover, so I kind of have this, like, I don't want to say, like, I th I think we're, like, in the Matrix, but, like, I kind of have... But you think we're in the Matrix. But I think we're in the Matrix, basically, what I'm trying to say. And I, yeah, I wanted to just write a song that was inspired by it, because I literally watched it again. I watched it 
like once a month at least, but I watched it again literally right before I went into the studio this one night. And I remember seeing like when the, he typed, when the computer types on the screen, like wake up Neo, follow the white rabbit. I was like, that's a really cool song title. And so I was like, let's just make something with, and usually I never do this. Like the steps of writing a song for me are usually like chords, melody, lyrics, record. Whereas this was like concept, lyrics, melody, record. It was just weird. Like we literally wrote it like it was a poem, basically, um, that felt like it could flow. And then we went on and did the, did the song. Was it the only song like that written in that way? Uh, pretty much. I think so. Like everything happens for a reason was like a freestyle that was like literally just sang like a few times on this like vintage mic and it just was perfect. It was so easy and so simple to write but yeah um i think that's probably the only one that we really did that with well madison i like the album that takes you on a journey i actually was going to text you last night to tell you that i liked it but i i didn't but it's the thought that counts right it is. and uh yeah i i really do it's i like not, though it's the thought that counts behind a gift not not you can't telepathically text somebody that's true well i knew i was gonna do it okay great you made up for it now i appreciate you saying that i'm glad you like it it really is a great body of work and i ask y'all to give it your ear please there's a link in the description below to life support an album we have been waiting for 17 songs this is thick with at least seven c's yeah at least it's a bit she's a she's a big girl dude well there's a lot of story to tell and there's a lot of time that you had to make up for oh well i have two two quick questions one um do you think your daft punk collab lover happened why did you have to just say that? Did you need to say that to me? Did you actually have to? Stop. I can't. I'm not ready to talk about this. Remember how I talked to you about things I'm healed from? I'm ready to talk about <laughs> it's an unhealed wound. Damn. That was crazy. Can you believe this? I know. Wild. I was not expecting to see that this morning. Of the world. I literally, no, like I woke up and my friend sent me the link and that was it. And I'm like, oh my God, new song. Cause like, it just says Daft Punk eulogy, right? Or what did it say? <laughs> um, what did it say? <laughs> no, I think one, yeah, one was that headline. Epilogue or ep- epilogue, is that a word? Epilogue. And I was like, I was like, is this a song? And so I click it all like excited, ready to go. And I'm like, oh my God, yay. And then it begins. And I see, you know how you can see like the top comments right underneath the video now? Yeah. I see someone being like gone but never forgotten. I'm like, what's he talking about? And then I kept watching. And when he like turned around, he unplugged his batteries and then like walked away and exploded. <laughs> I was like, yo, 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 yo. Like I watched my life end today. That was crazy. Do you think they hate each other? No, I think that they were robots sent on a mission to create amazing music and their mission is complete. Okay. <laughs> Oh my God. I'm here for it. Okay. Then that leads me into my final question. Speaking of missions, complete exploding. We talked about this. I think we talked about this recently. If you had the opportunity to go to the moon and there was a 50% chance you wouldn't make it back, would you go? Yes. Okay. Same. Why would I not? Like, what am I going to do? Die on earth from like something lame? I'd rather die on my way to the moon. That is my exact reasoning. I'm like, I'd rather say like, yeah, I died going to the moon. And if I make it back, great. I went to the moon. But there, there's much worse ways to die. I would love yeah, to take that chance. Worse ways to die is like, I, I just, and I feel like I'm going to die in a lame ass way. So I'm like, I'd rather just die in a cool way, go on the moon. Would Jesus. you go there? No, oh. no, no. What? I still have so much to figure out down here. But like, why? Like, why? Yeah. I'm also not in the physical shape to handle that. I think I would like my, my body would explode as it made its way to the moon and it, I'd just be a mess. Nobody wants me on that ship. Nothing matters. So like, just do it. Uh, and like, you figure out down here, like nothing's relevant and it matters. It was going to, you're a blip in the timeline. I, well, that is true. That is very, very true. You can be a blip in the timeline or you could be somebody who kind of disrupts the timeline or at least helps to bring about change. Well, that's, an argument. That's, a, that's, a, that's an argument people have like is there going to be a certain time which I'm sure there is that there's like everyone we were taught about in history or whatever that in a, there's going to be a time whether it's in a hundred years or a thousand years that they don't teach you about these people anymore and they're going to like they say there's they say that I, I'm so dark all the time they say that there's your death and then there's your like 
I think they call it like your like final death or something where it's like the last time anyone will ever speak your name is the final death. So there's like when you oh, actually Jesus. die and then there's when you like are ne- never, you will- never um, Zach ever again is anyone. <laughs> Well, thanks to the internet, I'll be on here for hopefully as long as the internet exists. Right? The internet may die too. I mean, yes. yeah, but why do you say that history is not going to be written? Like history for centuries has been. But like we don't know written. about like, like name someone from like 100 BC or whatever. Um, like someone Jesus. Like, no. no, BC is uh, isn't that literally before yeah, before Christ? Oh um, yeah, <laughs> 100 BC. It was like the Romans. Name someone. Julius Caesar. No, Julius Caesar was in like. When, like, when did he show up? We're all we're all literally dumb. <laughs> I love it. I love that every time we're about to wrap up, we always dive into like a conspiracy theory. Oh my I god! Well, Hundred BC, Julius Caesar. Ha! Oh yes, yes. Well, I was gonna say if you take all the Roman, I mean the uh, Egyptian pharaohs, they were all BC. Okay, fair, but like I'm just saying, like. About. We don't know of many people from that time era. So it's like yeah. there's a there's a date on Julius Caesar's earth death is long. Damn, he's been Yeah, so living. I'm saying like 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 history is documented. I think the time like but but not but the life death is, you know, it's not gonna be equal for everybody. I think historic figures like Donald Trump, like I, I, I you heard of him? Never heard of him. Um hopefully <laughs> well You know the forties mind blowers, like I wish I could just like mind blow donald trump out of my head. well, well we, sh- we can't do that because if we do that then we're going to repeat ourselves history is so important as we progress as a society remove him well well we yeah hopefully we we publicly and and, and legally exonerate him from society and like like expel him i'm just like put him in a booster seat and push the red button and shoot him out of the planet. But as long as we know that he existed and he did what he did, because then, you you know, history really repeats itself. So the only way you fix things is by teaching people True. history. Um, I- on, on that note, Life Support is the album. Uh, listen to it. There's a link in the description below. It really is a great body of work. Madison Beer, I thank you for giving us time and energy. Um, yeah. You know, dark and morbid all the time but love you and thanks for dealing with it no i really appreciate your honesty always and everyone else who pretends like they're all jolly and happy all the time you know yeah why why lie i I, pretending is so hard don't lie (laughs) amen daniel final thought hopefully we'll see you in person when you uh, have this next album out yeah me too you You want to hear a quick quick story Uh, real quick i I know you gotta go i do so I, I was sitting at an intersection once and um, I was sitting, I was like, who is driving this obnoxious bright red Ferrari? And is it Madison Beer? I drove by them after the light turned green and it was Madison. <laughs> well, was that David's Ferrari or yours? Why you got your, what? That was mine. Oh, was wow. It's Ferrari. Stop. Let's, we're not crediting David for my Ferrari. That, okay. That, sorry. I don't know so, what kind of relationship you have. I don't have a Ferrari. That's a joke. I I did for like a few months. And then I was like, no, nah, I don't really want this anymore. Because it's, you know, again, smoke and mirrors. It's the whole I- idea and thing where it's like, it seems so awesome until you're like, my head hurts. And this is loud and annoying. <laughs> so what do you drive now? Um, A G-Wagon. You make oh. me like such an asshole. <laughs> A G wagon, a car is like one hundred fifty thousand dollars and could withstand the apocalypse. So it could, it literally could. She drives. She, I can take her anywhere. Literally, I mean, that's the car you want to be in if there's a zombie apocalypse. I don't just die by the zombies. Okay, great. Yeah, you no, you don't like have lights in your house, so. We so why didn't you say that's hi to her true. when you drove by? She was it was clearly it was an a, intersection. Like I can't stop in the middle of an intersection. And be like hold on, I have to say hi to my friend. I haven't talked to her in a while. Well, yeah, you, you wave. Well, you know what? Next time you put out an album, I'll text you and tell you it's good. Next time I see you driving, I'll stop traffic. And also, like what 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 a steep uh, definition you put on your relationship, friend. Okay, yeah. an acquaintance that I haven't seen in a while. Friend, getting a little comfortable there, Dan. <laughs> Well, actually, never mind. We don't need to go there. Friend, what are you gonna say? What were you gonna? No, I was gonna say when you were talking about um, 
all the, uh, the the summer, everything you were going through, for some reason, a couple of your fan pages posted some of those uh, things on Instagram and tagged me in it and said, like, do you know what's going on with Madison? Is she OK? And I'm like, why are why are people tagging me in this? I don't know what's going on. Maybe I should know. Maybe I should reach out. But again, it's the thought that counts. But um, funny. during that whole period, I was going out of my house, which, by the way, I always wear sweatpants and a hoodie whenever I leave my house. But like I was wearing like cute outfits every day. And then I like when I started just being like morbidly miserable, I was like not wanting to wear anything other than sweatpants and a hoodie when I was going to the studio. And my fans started posting it being like, is she okay? She's only been wearing sweatpants and hoodies. And I'm like, that's what gave it away is that I was wearing like crew necks all the time. That's not what I was tagged in, but we can go with sweatpants. What were you tagged in? Um, You must have gone on Instagram live or something. I- crying yes it was that video i got tagged in that a couple times and they said do you know what's going on with madison i guess they were just reaching out for any answers that's a bad move i don't know what i was thinking like yeah <laughs> let me go live bawling my eyes out like anyone's gonna give a shit. Like, i was in bed well i just felt like i was like I, I i i don't know what to do and i literally just went live and i was just so sad and like I don't know, but I wouldn't know. I don't know if I would ever do that again. I went live the other day, hysterically crying, but like happy tears. I was like very just overwhelmed and grateful that everyone was being so nice to me about the album. And yeah. In that moment, do you feel like you have nowhere else to go? Yeah, honestly, that's probably why I did go live was because I felt like I was, you know, my, again, like I'm so close to my fan base and the people who make it up that I'm just like, this is who I have to talk to. And like, I don't, Sometimes I feel very alone in the real world, I guess. And, like, there's a lot of people who let me down. A lot of my friends don't step up to the plate when it's time to. And I I get really – I get really – I get way more hurt if I go to someone like, hey, I'm in pain, I'm upset, I'm hurting, and they don't deliver exactly how I want them to and, like, make me feel better, which I guess is, like, selfish of me, but that's just how I am. And so I feel like going to them, they they always are there for me and they never let me down. So that was kind of my like idea when it came to going live. But it still is like bad idea. Like, why do that? Yeah. Well, you know, people noticed. That's how yeah. I saw it. Well, there's comfort there. I appreciate your honesty and I thank you for sharing everything with us today and talking about life support. That is the album. It is a debut album. There's a link in the description below. You really should listen to it. It deserves your ear. Madison Beer, thanks for hanging out. Hey, beautiful human, thanks for watching our full interview, but I get it. Like, a full interview is a lot. So we got a clips channel. We don't expect you to watch the full thing anymore, so we just gave you the highlights. Please subscribe and uh, notifications and all that stuff. Okay, cool. I love you.